The Lockheed P-38 Lightning was considered the most sophisticated aircraft Lockheed had ever built, promising everything the Air Corps dreamed of. Blazing speed, devastating firepower, and revolutionary range. The Lightning story isn't just about aviation innovation, it's about the brutal price of pushing technology too far, too fast. What you're about to discover will change how you see this legendary aircraft forever. Kelly Johnson's revolutionary P-38 Lightning emerged from an impossible challenge. Create a fighter that could fly 400 miles per hour, climb to 20,000 feet in six minutes, and maintain that performance for over an hour. In February 1937, the US Army Air Corps released Specification X-608, a daunting requirement that called for speed, range, and climb capabilities impossible to achieve at that time with a single-engine aircraft. Johnson's solution was radical, twin Allison engines, counter-rotating propellers, and concentrated firepower in the nose pod. A survey of stateside training bases in 1941 showed that 87% of prospective pilots requested to be assigned to the big, sleek, twin-engine Lockheed Lightning. The aircraft looked like something from the future, and in many ways, it was. It was the first fighter with sufficient range to make ferry flights across the Atlantic and featured innovations that wouldn't become standard for years. The P-38's promise was intoxicating, but its problems were hidden beneath the surface. Army Air Force's leaders tried to control a rumor that lightnings killed their own pilots. This wasn't enemy propaganda. It was a deadly reality that would plague the aircraft throughout its service life. The lightning's greatest enemy wasn't the Luftwaffe or the Japanese Zero, but the laws of physics themselves. Yet this magnificent, flawed machine would go on to achieve legendary status, carrying America's top aces to victory while simultaneously claiming the lives of hundreds of its own pilots in training accidents. The contradiction was stark. How could the same aircraft be both salvation and destroyer? High above the European countryside, Major Signa Gilke pushed his YP-38 into a steep dive from 30,000 feet. At 320 miles per hour indicated airspeed, something went terribly wrong. The airplane's tail began to shake violently and the nose dropped until the dive was almost vertical. The controls locked solid, the control stick, as one pilot put it, was cast in about two feet of concrete. Gilkey had encountered compressibility, an invisible killer that would haunt the lightning throughout the war. During high-speed flight approaching Mark 0.68, especially during dives, the aircraft's tail would begin to shake violently and the nose would tuck under, steepening the dive. Once caught in this dive, the fighter would enter a high-speed compressibility stall and the controls would lock up, leaving the pilot no option but to bail out or remain with the aircraft until it got down to denser air. The physics were brutal and unforgiving. At transonic speeds, air in front of the wings became compressed and reached supersonic speeds as it flowed over the wings, forming a shock wave. This resulted in an increase in drag and a decrease in lift. The aircraft's center of lift moved rearward, forcing the nose down into an uncontrollable dive. Pilots found themselves passengers in their own aircraft, watching the ground rush up while their controls remained frozen. Kelly Johnson wrote about the concern of compressibility while the plane was being designed. In 1938, very little was understood about compressibility, and Kelly knew as much as anyone. But theoretical knowledge meant nothing when pilots were dying. The problem was identified during early YP flights in 1940, but Lockheed was screaming for time in a high-speed wind tunnel as soon as the problem was identified, but those in charge of the tunnels didn't want to risk damaging them. German pilots exploited this weakness mercilessly. They knew that in a dive, their Messerschmitts and Fokkerwolfs could outdive the lightning without fear of being followed. The very speed that made the P-38 formidable in level flight 
became its greatest vulnerability when gravity took control. The horror wasn't just in the physics, it was in the helplessness. Experienced pilots, men who had mastered every other aspect of flight, found themselves completely powerless as their aircraft dove towards certain death. But Gilkey's survival would provide the first clue to escaping this aerial trap. The statistics were staggering and hushed up by military censors. Many pilots died in training and routine flying before ever meeting an opponent in combat. The P-38's complexity made it a killer long before it reached the battlefield. Every switch, lever and system demanded precision and mistakes were often fatal. P-38 units were formed quickly once the United States entered World War II in December 1941. Training was rushed to get pilots and planes to Europe as quickly as possible. The urgency was understandable. America needed fighters over Europe immediately. But the lightning demanded time that war wouldn't allow. There was not a dedicated training path for high-performance twin-engine aircraft, let alone the P-38. This combined to the complexity of the aircraft, let alone the compressibility issue let to many accidents, especially with green pilots. Some of the better P-38 pilots who survived getting checked out in the aircraft managed to get several hundred hours in aircraft like the B-25 or A-20. This wasn't coincidence, it was survival. The Lightning demanded experienced twin-engine pilots, but the military was training single-engine pilots to fly it. The mismatch was deadly. Training deaths mounted throughout 1942 and 1943, creating a gruesome irony. The aircraft designed to save American bombers was killing American pilots faster than enemy action. Families received telegrams about training accidents, not heroic combat losses. The Lightning's reputation grew darker with each fatal crash at training bases across America. Yet those who survived the training crucible often became the war's greatest aces. The brutal selection process that killed so many also forged pilots of exceptional skill. Those who mastered the Lightning's complexities found themselves flying the most capable fighter in the Pacific, but the price paid in training blood was enormous and largely hidden from the public. The War Department's propaganda machine worked overtime to suppress reports of training fatalities, but word spread through pilot ranks. The lightning was beautiful, powerful and deadly, especially to those who flew it. With pilots dying and complaints mounting, Lockheed engineers worked frantically to tame their creation. Late in 1943, a few hundred dive flap field modification kits were assembled to give North African, European and Pacific P-38s a chance to withstand compressibility and expand their combat tactics. These dive recovery flaps were the company's Hail Mary solution, small wing flaps that could be deployed at high speed to help break the compressibility lock. But even this fix was plagued by wartime chaos. In March 1944, 200 dive flap kits intended for the European Theatre of Operations ETO, P-38Js were destroyed in a mistaken identification incident in which an RAF fighter shot down the Douglas C-54 Skymaster, mistaken for a German Focke-Wulf FW-200, taking the shipment to England. Desperately needed modifications were destroyed by friendly fire, leaving European Lightning pilots to face German fighters with unmodified aircraft. Meanwhile, back in Burbank, P-38Js coming off the assembly line in spring 1944 were towed out to the ramp and modified in the open air. The factory modifications were crude but necessary, engineers working with hand tools on completed aircraft, racing against production schedules while pilots died in training and combat. Experienced pilots developed workarounds that became squadron folklore. Major Gilkey's technique of using elevator trim to gradually recover from compressibility dives became standard training. 
pilots learned to crack their canopies slightly to prevent windscreen icing despite the brutal cold. They developed engine management procedures that Lockheed hadn't documented, trading official recommendations for techniques that actually worked in combat. Kelly Johnson's team had created a fighter that pushed every boundary of 1940s technology, but they'd also created a maintenance nightmare. The innovations that made the P-38 revolutionary also made it nearly impossible to keep flying. Each system advancement added layers of complexity that multiplied failure points exponentially. Despite testing having proved the dive flaps effective in improving tactical maneuvers, a 14-month delay in production limited their implementation, with only the final half of all Lightnings built having the dive flaps installed. By the time real solutions arrived, the war had moved on. But for pilots flying earlier models, improvisation remained their only hope for survival. The desperation was palpable in squadron ready rooms across the world, where pilots shared survival techniques that no manual contained, knowing their lives depended on hard-won knowledge that Lockheed couldn't provide. October 1943 marked a turning point in the European air war. German fighter pilots had destroyed 60 of 291 8th Air Force B-17 Flying Fortresses during a mission to bomb five ball-bearing plants at Schweinfurt, Germany. No Air Force could sustain a loss rate of nearly 20% for more than a few missions. The next day, the 55th Fighter Group flew its first P-38 mission from Britain, carrying the hopes of desperate bomber crews who needed long-range escort. But Europe proved to be the Lightning's nightmare theatre. The very high and very cold environment peculiar to the European air war caused severe power plant and cockpit heating difficulties for the Lightning pilots. At 25,000 feet over Germany, pilots faced temperatures that could freeze exposed skin in minutes. The P-38's heating system, designed for temperate climates, was completely inadequate. At 26,000 feet over Germany, pilots shivered in bitterly cold cockpits. Frostbite was common, and some pilots arrived back at base so weakened by cold that they had to be lifted from their cockpits. The aircraft that had dominated the warm Pacific skies became a frozen torture chamber over Europe. The engine problems were even more severe. Most of the aborts were related to engines coming apart in flight. European fuel formulations differed from American specifications, causing carburetor icing and mixture problems. European fuels didn't have the same aromatic mixture at first, so the American airplane were not properly jetted for it. Turbocharger intercoolers, designed for warmer climates, chilled the fuel-air mixture beyond operational limits. The statistics told the brutal truth. By September 1944, all but one of the Lightning groups in the 8th Air Force had converted to the P-51 Mustang. The Air Force had voted with its feet, abandoning the Lightning for the more capable Mustang. The P-38s of the 8th Air Force were rapidly phased out of service in favour of P-51 Mustangs as quickly as replacement aircraft could be delivered. Europe's verdict was final and unforgiving. The aircraft that had promised to revolutionise air combat became a footnote to P-51 supremacy. Bomber crews who had prayed for lightning escorts soon learned to prefer the Mustang's reliable protection. The Pacific War continued to showcase the lightning's capabilities, but Europe had exposed its fundamental limitations. The theatre that needed the P-38 most had rejected it most completely, leaving a legacy of what might have been if Kelly Johnson's revolution design had matched its ambitions with European reality. The numbers tell the Lightning's contradictory story with brutal clarity. In the Pacific theatre, Lightning pilots downed more Japanese aircraft than pilots flying any other Army Air Force's warplane. America's top two aces, Richard Bong with 40 kills and Thomas McGuire with 38, both flew P-38s exclusively. Yet in Europe, the same aircraft was systematically replaced by P-51 Mustangs as quickly as possible. The fatal trade-off was fundamental to the Lightning's DNA. 
Revolutionary performance came at the cost of reliability and simplicity. It was the first fighter for which compressibility problems were forecast, and among the first to experience compressibility. Kelly Johnson had pushed technology beyond existing boundaries, creating an aircraft that demanded perfection from both pilot and machine in an imperfect world. More lightnings were lost due to severe weather and other conditions than enemy action in some theaters. The machine designed to win air superiority was defeated by physics, weather, and its own complexity more often than by enemy fighters. Training accidents continued claiming pilots throughout the war, while mechanical failures grounded aircraft that should have been fighting. Yet those who mastered the lightning often refused to fly anything else. The aircraft's concentrated firepower, 4.50 caliber machine guns and a 20mm cannon firing through the propeller hub was devastating when it connected. Its speed and range were unmatched by single-engine fighters until the late war P-51. For pilots who survived its learning curve, the Lightning was the ultimate fighter. Over 10,000 Lightnings were manufactured, becoming the only U.S. combat aircraft that remained in continuous production throughout the duration of American participation in World War II. Despite its problems, the military continued ordering P-38s because nothing else could fulfill its mission requirements. The Lightning's flaws were real, but so were its unique capabilities. The P-38 Lightning embodies aviation's fundamental paradox. The pursuit of ultimate performance inevitably creates ultimate vulnerability. Its legacy is written in both triumph and tragedy, in Ace's victory tallies and training accident reports in Pacific glory and European failure. It remains a magnificent, flawed reminder that pushing boundaries comes with prices that statistics can never fully capture. The P-38 Lightning story reveals aviation's most dangerous truth. Revolutionary technology demands revolutionary sacrifice. From Kelly Johnson's drawing board to combat skies across the globe, this twin-boom marvel pushed every boundary while exacting a terrible price from those who flew it. For more untold stories of aviation's most controversial aircraft, keep watching our channel Vintage Planes, where engineering ambition meets wartime reality.